Oh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, anyway. we'll see what happens. Anyway, I better, I better shut up. Okay, let's start, and let me start the share screen first. Uh, today we were going to show you a a video first, not too long. It's only about ten minutes, and then we will uh, start our discussion. So here it goes. <laughs> You have the materials inside you right now to unlock the story of your deep, distant ancestry. And also mine. That's partly because you have mitochondria in your cells. And you got them only from your mother, not your father. And if on your 23rd pair of chromosomes you have an X and a Y, like I do, rather than an X and an X, then you got that Y chromosome only from your father. Together, these two facts mean that there's an unbroken line of mothers and mothers' mothers who passed down the DNA in their mitochondria for hundreds of millennia creating a biological thread that connects you to a single female ancestor, regardless of your gender. And it also means that there's a lineage of fathers and fathers' fathers who passed on their Y chromosome uninterrupted, leading back to a single male ancestor. Okay, now I know what this might sound like. I'm not talking about the first two people. I'm talking about two humans who lived at different times in the distant past, about 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. I'm talking about two people who never met but who, because of this odd quirk of genetics, combined with some unique evolutionary circumstances, managed to pass on a very small fraction of their genomes to you, and to me, to all of us. And this is an incredibly powerful tool for studying where we all came from. We're only beginning to understand the legacy of these two people to whom we're all related. It's a legacy that goes back some 10,000 generations. Let's talk about where this legacy begins in your own cells. Your mitochondria are the small structures that produce energy for your cells. And they're relics from a time more than two billion years ago when our ancestor was single-celled. And at some point, it engulfed another single-celled organism and started using it as an energy supply. As a result, mitochondria today still have their own, if very short, genomes. This is your mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA. And it's only passed down from the mother because egg cells have lots of mitochondria. But sperm cells only have a little, and they're destroyed after fertilization. Meanwhile, the Y chromosome is the smaller of the two sex chromosomes, X and Y. People with an X and a Y instead of two Xs are physiologically male. And there's a reason we study mitochondrial genomes and Y chromosomes to understand our ancestry. Actually, two reasons, because they have two important things in common. Their genomes are both pretty short, and they also don't recombine. Okay, here's what that means. In the process of creating sperm and egg cells, our chromosomes line up and exchange information. Matched pairs of chromosomes swap arms or legs with each other. This molecular do -si do is known as recombination, and it means that offspring will have slightly different combinations of genes on each of its chromosomes than its parents had. This is basically how sex creates new genetic variations. But Y chromosomes are much smaller than X's, and unlike the rest of our chromosomes, it doesn't match its partner, so it doesn't recombine with the X. And the mitochondrial genome doesn't recombine with anything either, because it doesn't have a partner to combine with. All of this means that these two snippets of genetic information get passed on, almost unchanged, from parent to offspring, which makes them traceable through time. So for decades, scientists have been studying these two bits of information, and they tell two stories about our history that are slightly different but still complement each other. For example, one of the most important things we've learned about ourselves from mitochondrial DNA is the story of human migration. Even though it's passed on from mother to child without recombining, mtDNA does slowly accumulate mutations. And as those mutations get passed on within a population, they start to form a genetic pattern within that group. This allows scientists to organize us into genetically similar groups called haplogroups. Anyone who's used a DNA test kit has heard of these. So if you and another person share most of these mitochondrial mutations, then you belong to the same haplogroup. And decades of research into mtDNA has shown that the vast majority of haplogroup diversity exists inside Africa. For example, there are several haplogroups that are only found in Africa or among people of African descent. These are groups like L0, L1, L2, and L4, 5, and 6. But the whole rest of the world is represented by parts of only one haplogroup, that's L3. So if you're of non-African descent, you belong to L3, which contains lots of subgroups like K, M, N, and R, which are found among populations outside Africa. But there are even more subgroups of L3 found within Africa. So what does all this tell us? Well, for one thing, it's taken as genetic evidence for what's known as the out-of-Africa hypothesis, the hypothesis that modern humans originated in Africa and spread throughout the world. This model was first developed by anthropologists around the 1980s based on skeletal evidence, specifically the earliest anatomically modern humans that were found in southern and eastern Africa. 
And today, this mitochondrial data is seen as molecular support for that idea, starting with a famous paper published in the journal Nature in 1987. That paper detected the first signs of these genetic patterns based on mtDNA sampled from just 147 people from five different geographic populations. But among other things, that study showed us that there's such a great diversity of haplogroups in Africa because that's where our genetic populations are oldest. So when a small group of people migrated out of Africa, they only represented some of the genes in the total human gene pool. Those migrants became the founders of their own genetic lineages found within the haplogroup L3. But there was still an older source population in Africa that they used to be part of. Now, we can also use changes to our mitochondrial DNA to estimate when certain lineages split off from each other. This method is known as the molecular clock, which we've mentioned before. It's based on the idea that mutations occur in empty DNA at a pretty regular rate. But since that rate of change isn't the same across all of humanity, the clock needs to be calibrated, like with the help of well-dated fossils and even the DNA of ancient fossil humans. Using this method, scientists have traced the mutations in all of the major lineages of people from haplogroup L3 that appear outside of Africa. Where those non-African groups converge in time, we find the earliest humans that left Africa. And the data suggests that this happened around 70,000 years ago. And going back even further, it appears that all known haplogroups converge at a single female ancestor who lived roughly 200,000 years ago. So our mitochondrial ancestor can tell us a great deal about where we came from and when. But we also have to talk about what she can't tell us. She isn't the first woman of our species, or the first anatomically modern human, or anyone really special for that matter. For one thing, there's evidence of modern humans as far back as 300,000 years ago in northern Africa. So we know our species was around long before this woman lived, for thousands of generations. But their mtDNA just didn't make it to the present day. The fact that one woman passed on her mitochondrial genome to all of us is really just a matter of chance. Think of it this way. In any given generation, a woman might have sons but not daughters. And if she only has sons, that means none of her mitochondrial DNA will get passed on. So our mitochondrial ancestor is the only person who managed to have one or more female offspring, who in turn also had female offspring, in an unbroken line for the past 200,000 years, by sheer chance. Now, naturally, there are a lot of limitations to what mtDNA can tell us. The dates it provides us aren't very precise, and the genomes themselves are small, representing a tiny fraction of the information that's in our whole genome. And of course, they only tell us about half the population, females. So while mtDNA was crucial as an early source of genetic data, as sequencing methods started to improve, scientists began studying the other non-recombining stretch of DNA, the Y chromosome. And much of this work was done in the early 2000s. And just as mtDNA can shed light on the growth and spread of certain maternal bloodlines, the Y chromosome can tell us about the migration patterns of some groups of men. For example, a pair of studies in 2010 and 2013 sequenced both the Y chromosomes and mtDNA from 2,740 people across Indonesia. And the results showed that a surprising amount of Y chromosome DNA came from far away, like China, India, Arabia, and even Europe, especially in Indonesia's western islands. On the island of Borneo, for instance, the presence of the Y haplogroup known as OM7 seems to be the fingerprint of immigration of men from Han Dynasty China about 2,000 years ago. But in those same men, their mitochondrial DNA more closely resembled local haplogroups. So that suggests that, at least over the past few thousand years, men have been arriving from elsewhere and pairing up with local women. And when it comes to how far back this Y chromosome goes, the latest molecular clock calibrations now suggest that our Y chromosomal ancestor lived about 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. Much like with our mitochondrial ancestor, this guy must have had at least one male offspring, who in turn had more males, in an unbroken line for hundreds of millennia. Now, we don't really understand why these two individuals left the indelible mark that they have in our genomes. One idea is that there might have been a boom in the human population around 200,000 years ago in Africa, when our species happened to be doing very well for itself. If that were the case, then the offspring of both of those people may just have been more likely to survive and pass on their DNA. Or in the case of our Y chromosome ancestor, it could be that he had a sort of Genghis Khan thing going on, having many, many, many kids, some of whom were sons who also went on to have many, many, many kids. But the story that these two people can tell us ends when they were born, because we can't trace their genetic trail any further back in time. So to probe the origins of anatomically modern humans, we need earlier sources of data. Remember, the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial genome represent just a small fragment of the human genome. So to understand the whole range of human diversity, we need to study the whole range of human diversity. Luckily, this is the 21st century, and we no longer have to sequence tiny stretches of individual genomes by hand. We can sequence whole genomes, and quickly. So as our technology and methods improve, we may soon be able to reach beyond the lives of these two ancestors into the even deeper past. But even when we do, each of us will continue to carry the molecular legacy of one man and one woman who managed to make their mark on all of humanity. Thanks for joining me today for this truly amazing story. And big thanks to our eontologists, Jake Hart, John Ivey, and my boy Steve. Now, let me give you my two cents. Actually, Two Cents is a new series from PBS Digital Studios about money and you. 
Financial experts and husband and wife team, Philip Olson and Julia Lorenz Olson, guide you through the complex world of personal finance, from the kitchen table to the stock exchange. You'll get practical knowledge about how to spend, save, and earn, and even insights into how your brain is hardwired to react to economic problems. Money might make the world go round, but it doesn't have to make your head spin, so check out the link in the description and subscribe to Two Cents. Now, what do you want to learn about? Leave me a comment, and don't forget to go to youtube.com slash eons and subscribe. Okay. A very short uh, presentation. Basically, that is the evidence that we are all coming out from Africa. So that's what I want want to say is we are all Africans. <laughs> but at least um, 70,000 years ago. But before us, we have other humans like uh, the the... Homo erectus or Homo neanderthals, they have left Africa as well. I think one of the most successful uh, Homo which left Africa before us is probably the Homo erectus. They actually reached China as well as Indonesia. So just just imagine that that will be about two million years to three million years ago. So it's a long, long time ago. Any points want to discuss? No? Not, not really. <laughs> it's, it's still looking interesting for our Aboriginal people. What if they find more than 70,000 years ago evidence? Yeah, I, 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 that would be very interesting because at the moment, we 70,000 years ago, also another thing that happened is the... Um, Tobin, is that called Tobin? Tobin uh, volcanoes. The volcano, yes. Yeah, the, the big volcanoes about 70,000 years ago. So I will touch on that as well because that will be a bottleneck. Uh, a lot of uh, humans might have died at that time and, and therefore uh, our current uh, population is actually originated from a very small pool of humans. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are so similar outside of America, Africa. Be probably because of that. And also, maybe because of that, the genomes that we are talking about is incorrect in the sense that it is those who left earlier might have died and left no, no descendants because of that uh, volcanoes. And therefore, we, we don't see them nowadays. But so that that will be another interesting. Uh, I want, I'm looking at for the evidence that it has happened. So I'm basically the evidence that we are from Africa come from the DNA genomes. So that is that is the point of this is this is the evidence because we talk about that all the have been we have talked about that saying that uh, our cooking may have started at the. Uh, reef valleys in the eastern Africa. Okay, so, but if the other thing I, I'm just searching, I don't know whether anyone can help me, is what do we bring out from Africa? Do we bring languages out? Do we bring the technique of making uh, stone tools out? Do we bring techniques of making fire out? Because obviously, a human has been eating cooked meat much earlier, maybe 2 million, 1 million, 2 million years. And we are talking about 70,000 years ago. So by then, I think human might have already managed to uh, make fire. Oh, so, but, um, where do you get the figure 70,000? To me, that seems remarkably recent. Yeah. I, I would say that um, uh, humanity would have come out of um, Africa um, much earlier than that. Yeah, well, definitely there are other hu humans which have left Africa much earlier. For example, the um, Homo erectus and the Neanderthals. Okay. So they left Africa much earlier. 
the whereas for human uh, Homo sapiens, that's us, we left about seventy thousand years ago. Maybe actually we have left much earlier. Maybe we have left it, uh, let's say, uh, a hundred thousand years ago, or even fifty five hundred thousand years ago. But because Look, I, I would think so. Where did you get that seventy thousand figure? The seventy thousand figures come from the genomes. Yes, you just saw it on the tape you watched. Yeah, in the tape we 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 they, yeah um, yeah yeah, and they, they showed that the in, the in, uh, the issue is that because seventy thousand years ago we know we have a big um, volcanoes which killed a lot of humans, so maybe there are. Homo sapiens who left Africa earlier, but they yes. don't left yes. descendants. Bad luck. <laughs> Only those who <laughs> left no descendants. <laughs> yeah. So we, we are descendants from those who left seventy years ago, a uh, seventy thousand years ago, but those who left much earlier, unfortunately, haven't got the descendants. Left, no, 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 or no. haven't found them yet. Well, the the, Amer the Australian Aborigines might be a good source to look at. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, the other thing that um, oh, sorry, you go, Valerie. I was just going to say we're back to sixty thousand years, so you know it's very unexplored. Um paleontology-wise, Australia. So if we find another 10,000 years or more, we got to look at them being from an earlier migration. Yeah. From Africa or starting here. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, obviously the problem is that um, so much um, uh, First Nation archaeology is being destroyed, and even up to this present day, I mean, um, the mines in um, central Queensland um, are an example of what's been going on for the last um, uh, 230 years. But what the point I was going to make before, um, one thing that wasn't in that uh, video that we saw. There were maps of immigration from Africa, but it didn't show um, immigration to um, um, the Americas. Although we did discuss that last week. Yeah, uh, because I, I want I I want to look at um, because I I have been try and struggle with whether we, I want to talk about the other homos or just concentrate on talking about homo sapiens. Because mm. I think from here now onwards, I will, will just narrow down to talk about homo sapiens. And then we know that the uh, homo erectus and the aphetos use stone tools. So obviously homo sapiens also knows how to use stone tools. So we bring our stone tools out of Africa. I think we the stone tools might have originated in Africa already. If that's true, then for stone tools being passed on from one generation to other, I suppose there will be some language as well in order to really help passing that knowledge onwards. That means we are bringing the language out from Africa as well. And uh, for the humans to keep... Oh, sorry, sorry. As we discussed last work, week, there are also um, chimpanzees and perhaps um, other monkeys who um, are able to make uh, primitive tools. Yep. What's the name? Yeah, lots of them ha can be. For example, we we saw some uh, monkeys being able to fish ants by making straws, etc., into thin thing and then stuck into the ants to to fish out ants. So yes, the but the sophistication of the tools 
human can use. Means there will be、uh, learning between generations. You need you need to learn. It's not just by watching. Is that I think, for example, finding the right stone to make a stone tools, or tra- trading the the stone from long distance in order to get the best kind of stone to make stone tools. This kind of thing had to happen. Uh, before Homo sapiens left Africa,、mm-hmm. so they they bring out. So at the moment, I'm I'm guessing they would have bring out at least oral language. Now, when you're talking about language, there's something that is that intrigues me, and that is dogs. Now, dogs can understand. Um, the language of the humans、um, that they grow grow up with, they cannot communicate、um, effectively with humans, but、um, they、um, they do understand language. Now,、um, classic example of that that I remember personally, I was at my late brother's place and.、Um, uh, He offered me a lift、um, in the car, and he said,、um, "Well, as soon as he used the word car, his dog Putri, who was next to him, woofed." Now, in a huge sentence, he recognised the word car <laughs> because that may be the chance for the dog to go out. Absolutely, he wanted、um, a, a ride in the car. Of course, he did, and he got it too. But、um, yeah. And um, um, similarly with、um, cats. Now we used to have a cat when I was growing up, who、um, would go to the fridge and、um, sit in front of the the fridge and meow. Now my father used to swear black and blue that he could tell whether the cat was saying me. Or meat. <laughs> well, at least I understand. I know noticed my at、uh, my my daughter's dog here.、Um, wherever I eat something, it he will appear. Whenever there's which, sorry. Wherever I'm eating something. Oh yeah. Oh well, he's smelling the food. And, I don't know、yeah. how he knows. Any time, wherever I'm eating anything. He he will just appear, and then obviously he also know his own name. So when you call him, he,、oh, yes. yeah. and then But, he also understand、uh, the commands for some tricks. You know, to get the food. So obviously、yeah. they can can they understand to a certain degree our language. Yeah. But the、oh, the way they the the way they、yeah. communicate that is different because they. They don't have our own core ability. Absolutely. Now, the next, well, the obvious question from that, when a parrot says things like "pretty boy, pretty boy," or whatever, do are the parrots just imitating the sounds, or do they have some concept of what they're actually saying? That、I、is a very answer, good question, a, Albert. I, it is a good question, isn't it? It's a very <laughs> good question because we know, for example, there is、uh, the lion birds. Is that lion birds? Lion, lion bird. Yeah. Yeah, they mimic、uh, mimic all kinds of sounding, or including chainsaws. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Look, um, uh, a recent well, a story I heard last week, um. Our,、um, my synagogue's holding、uh, Zoom services, and there was a, a lady who chanted from the、um, the scroll from the Torah, the first five books of Moses, and she practiced and practiced and practiced、um, for weeks beforehand. And outside her window is a tree with a bird's nest in it, 
and after a number of practices, the bird um, sang along with her Ooh. using the same tune that she was using for her practice. Well, amazing. I think the birds imitate songs for sexual attraction to to its partners. Amongst other things. Among other things, but what else we don't know. But for dogs, obviously... Well, to attract they, themselves they, to humans is one other thing. Yeah. They are so close to humans, so therefore they understand human behavior. Yeah. For example, um, the, the my daughter's dog... Uh, he had to work every Wednesday. We sent him to a uh, disabled person's home to to be a company. So I, I, I did that early in the morning. So on Wednesday morning, I'll call him and then he knows he come out, eat his breakfast and then get ready to go. To, <laughs> he, he know exactly what what to do. Yeah. And, and then by... By the time I arrive at that um, lady's uh, outside, open the door, the dog knows where to go. <laughs> of course. Oh, yeah. He knows exactly. And uh, that family also trained Toby very well so that he always peer and pull at a particular spot. Oh, yes. Well, cats particularly are very good at that and um, using kitty litter. Uh, yeah, that, but that, that needs a little bit of training. So I, I'm still working on what kind of um, um, knowledge or what kind of things Homo sapiens has bring out. Uh, probably the two... The, the three things I think must be included is the fire, the ability to make fire, uh, probably language, or at least oral language, and then the skill to make some stone tools. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. You think they could make fire when they left Africa? I think so. I think so. Because so that means they were perhaps eating meat? Yeah. They will have, uh, I think they will know fishing, mm. probably, for those living close to the coast or to rivers. They probably will know and know a lot about the surroundings, know how to get the kind of food which can be eaten and which can't. Because uh, just... Because by by then the homo hope for for us Homo sapiens where we left we have this large brain already. You think we had the once we're eating meat we have the large brain, and we don't have to spend so much time getting food. Yeah, and so that's you, and that yeah. is the evolution advantage we got. Yeah, and that advantage multiply. Yeah. So if we we can walk further in a day if we don't have to get food. Yeah, because we don't have, because we are full, we don't need to carry as much food as well. Mm. But oh, you all, spend the day eating grass. <laughs> you also have um, the division along um, um, sexual lines of um, what to do with the food. But the male is the hunter-gatherer who goes out and gets the food, brings it back, and then um, the female is the preparing the food. Yeah. I uh, think the female is the gatherer, Yeah. not the hunter-gatherer. Oh. And I think uh, mm -hmm. most of the food probably comes from her gathering rather than his hunting. Yeah. Uh, uh, the... the one one thing I always say that um, the biggest punishment to women is don't allow them to talk. Stopping is gathering. Yeah, because um, during during gathering, uh, obviously children follows their mother. 
especially when、uh, they are still drinking milk from the mother, and therefore the the women will be bringing their children out during gathering gathering of food. But obviously,、well. when you are having occupied with gathering, that means your children will may be wandering around. So <laughs> the only method of ensuring that your children are safe and the other women are safe is by constantly talking. But what you're talking about, Albert, and you were talking about, Valerie, this is comparatively recent. This is after、um, humanity learned how to plant. Crops. No, 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 no. no this is well during... before the horror of agriculture. Yeah, agriculture. it's well before that. And he slaved us. But, <laughs> but then it was the male who was the hunter and the gatherer. No, the male has always the been just the hunter. Always be less males, more females. More females gathering. Females from, from, yeah,、right. we we know that know. from watching、know. the other.、Uh, Uncivilized tribes, how the Aboriginal people behave. Yeah, it. I mean, I I can see how in the、uh, Arctic area you would be mainly relying on hunted food, but in most of the world you're relying on gathered food with occasional hunted food. And that's you know, why I mean, meat is. Before agriculture, if, in Australia there wasn't much agricultural practice by the Aborigines, but. An awful、oh, we're, gathering. We're starting to find that there was more than we thought. Yes, but、yeah. only in areas where the environment allowed it. Yeah, most not, most. Not that many areas. Yeah, but、well, <laughs> another interesting thing that's come out is from the, I think in America somewhere. I I don't I can't recall it is in the Southern America or the or the Northern America. And a French、uh, has what has had gone to there first, and describe a very vibrant society. But later on, when other ex- explorer arrived in Africa,、uh, America, they can't find it, and say he was lying.、Mm. But now it has discovered that actually. Because of his arrival, he brought the germs with him, which the、um, the local、uh, Aborigines can don't have the immune system, and therefore there is a almost genocide. And therefore, when the next batch of European arrive, the civilization is gone.、Mm. Yeah. Well, this is not only、um, America. This is throughout the world.、Um, one of the worst places were the Pacific Islands, where、um, oh, and Australia, where、um, people were catching diseases from、um, Europeans, for which、um, they had no experience and therefore no、uh, natural immunisation. Yeah.、Uh, also, the Black Death is the same, isn't it? In in Europe, the bread bread death is brought by the merchants from Middle East, I think, and the Middle East people got that from China. But one of the things with the Black Death was that at the time,、um, Europeans did not wash properly. They did not wash their hands. Now, one of the few people in、um, uh, in Europe who washed their hands was my mod, the Jews,、um, and this goes back to、um, the Bible. And、um, because we washed our hands,、um, most Jews did not get the plague, and therefore, obviously, we were blamed for、um, for bringing the plague. I think I'd have to check out that. I think it'd be almost impossible to know, but some, someone、uh, who's Jewish probably subscribes to it for obvious reasons. But I think if you go, uh, back, I, I think I there's think a lot of evidence. Go back to the primates. In a primate society, it'd be unusual to have many men around. I mean, 
why would you need them? And in nature, you don't keep things you don't need, and they don't have much use unless, the, you know, they eat and they don't have babies. So they are not that much use to a primate society. So I, most of the food would be gotten by females because they'd be the main gender that would be... So there'd only be a few alpha males that would be doing the hunting and would have access to females. The rest would either be off in troops or be killed by the other males. There's no point. You know, remember, they were always starving. You can't waste energy on males keeping them around. They don't have babies. Same with older females. There's no point to them. In nature, they're a waste of energy. Look, you know what I mean? You're absolutely it might be right. It's hard for men to realise this, but most men only exist now because we've developed cultural norms and enough food to keep them. They don't have any real use if they're not, you know, once you've given up your sperm, what use are you? If you're not protecting a female, you're no use to the Look, survival of your species. What you say about few males is fascinating. Mm. And this happens even up till today. Mm. Um, I, I believe my statistics are correct. You can Google it in and check me. But in normal times, um, 98% of babies are male and 102% of babies are female. But in periods like 1939 to 1945, the number of males got up to something like 110%. In other words, nature was compensating for the males that were killed in the war. Or maybe our culture is artificially uh, killing off the uh, female. Ba yeah, female baby, uh, fem yeah. Uh, female this babies. Is very uh, hard. No, no, this is this is natural babies. This, this is this is nature compensating. How would nature know to compensate? This is not some god making things up. This is just chance. Well, um, well, it depends whether. You, whether you, it depends whether you believe that God and nature are the same thing or not. It, yeah, uh, I don't want it, to go down that path, but I'm just well, saying, if you think there's some mighty plan to it, and that plan can adapt quickly to war to shove up a few more males that in 40 years will be able to fight, it's uh, a long straw. 40 years? <laughs> um, 18 years. 20 years. The, yeah, I, I think, think yeah. one of the reasons we have wars, um, Albert, is because we keep males alive and there's not that much to do with them really in terms of survival of the species because a lot of them are not meant to go on. That The male isn't... Uh, you're meant to have some real high flyers who will keep the species good by breeding and the rest of them, the also ran. What are you going to use them for? So they used to use them in wars. You know? <laughs> now yeah. you kill your females and your males, so we look in the face of extinction the whole time. But the the the, um, the split of responsibility actually might relate to cooking as well. Because once you cook a, cook a food, the, the aroma the, the, of the food spread through the air. So oh, sure. it will attract other wandering groups to try to grab the food. So there's a role for uh men or, or male to protect the, the cooking food. So they are actually more like the guards and the women are cooking. So usually in, in most culture, women cook. Chinese yeah. culture and the European culture as well. Sure, Except the sure. French. <laughs> Except the French. <laughs> Except the French? <laughs> uh, but that that's comparatively recent. But, um, I'm only joking, Albert. <laughs> now, the, other, the other thing is, now, um, from study of the so-called uncivilized tribes, there are a number of uh, customs, social customs that have been uh, uh, available. First of all, 
is gathering is usually done by females with at the same time of looking after children. Mm. Males usually gather together by themselves, preparing weapons, etc., and they don't hunt every day. They hunt only occasionally. Mm. And of course, when they get the meat back, the successful hunter will get the bulk of the meat, but he will share it with his other other uh, male friends. So the other families will have uh, a bit of meat. The, the main staple, the main energy source, come from gathering. Meat is only occasional, and that's why today a lot of us is suffering in health because we eat too much meat. Mm. Because evolutionary, we might be eating meat once a, a week, or maybe twice a week, yeah. but we are now eating meat almost every meal. So we are eating too much meat. Yeah. So that's also so that uh, hunting is not actually very efficient in terms of uh, getting the energy required. Whereas gathering is much more reli reliable in gathering the, the energy that we need. So that is always the and then you, you a lot of um, laborious work, carrying big load, for example, in a in, uh, society where the water is very far away, that's usually done by the females as well. The male is basically, as, as I'm a male, I can say is pretty lazy in terms of looking after the family. The, the female is much more responsible than the male in looking after the family. You think that all comes back to a time when they wouldn't have had many males, that males would either be killed in the hunt or killed by other males, and one male would father a lot of children from a no large number of females. That yeah. strong, dominant male would be the one to be doing that, and that would keep the species strong. Yeah, and just like the, the, in the uh, monkey world, the alpha male controls all the females basically and kind of give the protect give the protection to the females from the other 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 bands of attacking the the group so we need a alpha male in nature there are still many animal species where the male is rare um, look at um, the number of cows to the number of rams look at the number of um, 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 chickens to the number of um, cockerels. Uh, that will be an interesting thing because now uh, I know that uh, when the chickens are hatched, there will be a sorter to sort out the males from the females, and the males will end up to be minced into dog food or other other things because they are they they are not killing them. Nicely, just throw it into a crusher. Because they don't have eggs. Since um, humanity has come into the picture, but even before um, humans bred um, chickens, you still had the disproportionate um, mixture. I don't know about that. I don't um, know about that. The yeah, males get so. killed off by other males, or and maybe even, well, um, you know, but, not in the case of roosters, but I think in nature there will be a sorting out because that makes the species strong. Well, for example, you, I think, is that pay, uh, pay, uh, is there any, uh, bird, I think there's a lot of birds which have a single partner throughout the life. Yes, 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 there are. But, but not chickens. And as I said, um, look, the other classic example is um, um, sheep and rams. Yes, but that's because we only allow a few male rams or sheep to grow up to be rams. No. I lived on no. a farm, um, Albert. I can tell you what happened to male lambs. They went straight off to become lamb chops. But, but you'll find that in, in nature, without um, um, human intervention, this is, this is what happens. Well, for example, um, we have whales. Is that whales? Is that 
me young young male cattle. Veil. Yeah. Yeah. Veil. Yeah. Yeah. Veils. So we we need to kill off the young young males because we don't need that much. So this is human intervention. That's right. In nature, uh, we have the X and Y homosexual, and they they combine almost randomly, and therefore we almost have half half male and female. So yeah. we human another another interesting evolution for human race. Uh, sorry, Sam, go ahead. Yes, uh, very interesting that uh, uh, to hear. Uh, different opinions. Now, so can I just uh, bring you back to the why the strong man is the need of, oh, so sorry, can I say, even in the animal, uh, because if it's a man, then you say that you have a brain and everything, but even in the, in the animal, just like a lion, wolf, monkey, whoever is strong, and that will be survive. If it's not, they will be cut off from the from the okay. and survival of the fittest. When, uh, even the birds, they had, when the female birds are trying to search for a male birds, and they have to, they won't have a nest, and they are then then the the bird the female the male bird will be do all thing and then dancing and then subdue everything. But if it's a female bird, mm. see, no, that is not good enough, that is nothing. So they will go away and will change too, because they also want to have a stronger next generation. Yeah. And again, this is uh, what, what, what we can see, even the, the that is a natural mother love. Mother love, that is for the next generation and taking care of the next gen generation. Mm -hmm. So that's why all these things mainly will be the female. And the male, which is left out, then they were just no use, they were just carried out. Yeah. And well, this is a natural mm -hmm. one for the next generation. Sexual selection also can be pretty stupid. For example, peacocks. <laughs> what the hell you need that beautiful? tail <laughs> except to attract the females <laughs> so to this for survival from the point of survival this is stupid <laughs> but the sexual selection do go that way so quite interesting uh, sexual selection is not always smart sometimes it's pretty stupid another another thing for example if you are into um aquariums, the fish, the beautiful fish is usually the male fish. The the female is usually the pain looking not as beautiful. Because the female is selecting the best looking fish to mate with. So the fitness here is once you put in this uh sexual selection is it seems that it's weird. Yes, mm -hmm. Sam? Yes, uh, just recently, I just uh, seen the one of, uh, you know, that uh, arwana fish is a chinlong. What was it? And normally, uh, we are, our understanding is the, the female lay the egg out. And then, the, and then the, the, the male will give the sperms on the, on the, on the, on the eggs, and then uh, will we just let it go in the hex and in the on the on the on the on the, on the grasses? But I seen, uh, but actually I seen another one is a different a different type, which is very strong fish. That the the male he take all those uh, those eggs. And hacks in their in their mouth as long as uh, they require it. Sometimes it's more than a week or two weeks until the 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 fish come out from the mouth. Uh, come then, <laughs> then gradually just uh, leg it out. Yeah, from the mouth. 
And that is a fin. That is a male job for protecting the 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 fertilized eggs. Yes, and then the penguin, the king penguin, the fin. The normally the king pink, uh, king uh, male is going out to take the to to take the food back, but when the female lay the eggs out. Then the whole winter, cold winter, that is a male to look after, mm. and even to stand down there and not to to move, mm -hmm. and then the male, the female will just go out to to catch the fish. So the the set the sexual separation of job actually yes, varies it depending on species and. Oh, and yeah. Okay, so. It's, it's, um. There's one other interesting thing there most well um i would say that animals are divided into two different types um there are those like um, humans like uh, lyre birds like um uh, rams and um, um where you can see dramatically the difference between a male and a female then there are other animals like uh, dogs, cats, even horses, where you really got to go up close and really look to see the difference between the two sexes. Yeah. The se sexual appear appearance is some, some animals is very obvious, some is not. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Another, uh, there's another mystery. Why? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Yeah. But anyway... I need to do research to answer that question. <laughs> and okay. we will see you around in China today. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Albert. Okay. Bye for now. Yeah.